thank you again for coming out. Um, as uh, Dennis introduced me, my name is Mark Rodilio. I'm with the DEP's Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Reserves. So one of my main areas of work uh, with the DEP is uh, spoil enhancement, restoration and monitoring. So I'm going to give you an overview of the different types of spoil programs that we do, as well as just kind of a flavor of the other projects that we're involved in. And like Dennis mentioned, we just uh, went through a draft phase of our Indian River Lagoon System Management Plan. It's a huge document. It's got a lot of great background information about the Indian River Lagoon, as well as outlines our um, management goals and objectives. So I highly recommend if you guys are interested in that sort of thing to look it up online. You can just Google Indian River Lagoon System Management Plan, and it should come right up as one of the top choices. And you can download it from uh, the DEP website. <clears throat> So like Dennis said, um, I work for the DEP, the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Preserves. Um, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is a huge organization. Uh, we're a very small subsection under the Florida Coastal Office called the Aquatic Preserve Program. So you can basically think of us kind of like a state park. But instead of managing bodies of land, we manage bodies of water. In our case, for our sub-office, the Indian River Lagoon. And so we have seven separate aquatic preserves that range from Volusia County down to Palm Beach County. You can see our different aquatic preserves here from Mosquito Lagoon down to the Banana River and then the Indian River proper pretty much from the Malabar area all the way down to Jupiter Inlet. And it is a huge task. Uh, we're a small office. It's about 95,000 acres of aquatic preserve of the Indian River Lagoon that we manage with a very small office. So we're very dependent on working with the community to accomplish a lot of our goals, which is what I'm going to kind of outline today. And these aquatic preserves are, are protected areas. They're designated as exceptional areas of submerged sovereign lands. And we manage them with a couple main goals and tenets. The first one is to protect and enhance the ecological integrity of the Indian River Lagoon. Um, probably preaching to the choir, you guys are probably aware the Indian River Lagoon is a very uh, valuable habitat. It's considered one of the most biologically diverse estuaries in North America. And it's a, a big draw to this area for commercial and rec uh, recreational purposes. So our office works a lot to preserve the integrity of that system. Um, we have a lot of endemic or threatened endangered species that live in our area. We have the, the federally endangered wood stork that nests along a lot of our shorelines. The um, Indian River Lagoon is a seagrass-based estuary, which is essentially the basis for our ecosystem here and supports a lot of um, endangered species like manatees, as well as uh, commercially or recreationally important fish species, redfish, snook, things of that nature. Um, the other side of that same coin, one of our other tenants, is to encourage sustainable use and foster stewardship by engaging the local community. So that puts us in kind of an interesting position. Not only do we want people to go out and, and um, utilize the Indian River Lagoon, to utilize those resources, but we want to protect that habitat at the same time and preserve it for future generations. So it's a, a line that we have to walk to ensure that these resources are going to be there for the future while still encouraging people to get out and use, utilize them as much as possible. And we accomplish that through education. So we do a lot with, with volunteers to accomplish our goals because it is one of our main tenants and because we are a small office. So we'll take volunteers out and do different types of native plantings or, or wetland reconnections, or um, we'll install kiosks or educational signs to kind of make people more aware of the value of these resources. So like I said, one of the main projects that I'm involved in is the Spool Island Project. For those of you who have driven up and down uh, US-1 or A1A or had a chance to boat on the Indian River Lagoon, You've probably seen those islands that dot the intracoastal waterway from Brevard County all the way down to Martin County. Um, those are not natural islands. They are actually man-made back in the 1940s and 50s when they were dredging the intracoastal waterway. Basically, they didn't have anything to do with that dredge spoil from digging out the channel. They just placed it off the side and created these mounds of sand. Um, over the last 60 to 70 years, those islands became vegetated, and they became the resource that they are today. So you see there's a, there's a breakdown of, uh, based on county, how many islands there are. There's about 124 that are under state management. There are some that were vested to counties or, or private institutions for one reason or another. But um, back in 1990, our Aquatic Preserve Office uh, drafted a management plan, basically to determine how we were going to manage these islands based on what we felt was appropriate. And we broke it down into three main categories. Uh, recreation, conservation, and education. And they're pretty self-explanatory. Recreation islands are open to the public to go camping, picnicking, fishing, things like that, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Conservation islands are typically ideal habitat for some sort of species or fills an ecological niche that we, had, uh, we felt had value to it. For a lot of the Indian River Lagoon, that's going to be bird nesting habitat. So a lot of our conservation islands are really big bird rookeries. And then education islands are, are kind of the odd man out. They put, possess a lot of uh, diverse or native uh, Florida habitat. Um, they're suitable for recreation, but they're also really great areas for us to take out educational groups, um, Boy Scout troops, environmental school, 
uh, groups to kind of give them an idea of Indian River Lagoon habitat and help them learn about our local resources. Um, so here's just a map. This is actually a Brevard in Indian River County to kind of just give you an idea of how they're set up down the Indian River Lagoon. Like I said, they pretty much just follow the intercoastal waterway and head down. And these, these, these are some of the designations for them. I have BC 47 circled. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that island um, and some of the projects we did, obviously, just so you can kind of see where it is in the grand scheme of things. So, like I said, um, our, we have our recreation islands, which are open to the public, and we have our conservation islands, which are typically really big bird nesting habitat. And we have the gamut of different types of coastal birds nesting on those islands. Uh, if you guys are familiar with any of the birds around here, you know, any, any coastal birds, great blue herons, pelicans, wood storks, ibis, cormorants, those, those types of coastal bird species rely heavily on our, our islands for nesting. Um, it's becoming more and more important as we have development increase on the barrier island on the mainland, these birds are, are running out of refuges or places where they can nest without disturbance by humans or just available habitat to nest. So we do a lot of monitoring of those islands, especially during the nesting season, to get an idea of how um, nesting is increasing or decreasing. And then we'll conduct management activities based on that to kind of enhance that, that nesting and provide for more suitable habitat for them. They're definitely not 100% protected out there. There are a lot of threats and things that we try to work with. Uh, one of the big ones is monofilament entanglement. The islands and the areas around those islands are really great fishing. Um, we get a lot of monofilament line that gets accidentally caught up in the trees, and that can cause mortality in birds if they get entangled in it. So during the off-nesting season, we'll go out to a lot of these conservation islands, pull all that monofilament line out there, try to reduce any chances of mortality. And disturbance is still a big issue, too. A lot of people are mobile with boats or, or kayaks, and they can cause the birds to flush during the nesting season and uh, abandon or uh, possibly endanger their chicks. So. I got a lot of questions from the public about, about uh, the different designations of the islands, so I wanted to throw this up there about how you can know which islands are conservation, which are recreation. A lot of the conservation islands don't have signs on them, so it can be a little tricky to know, but we try to provide as much information in different outlets as possible for, to make people aware of the different designations. Um, at most boat ramps around here, there is a little kiosk box at the boat ramp, and it'll have the um, spoil on brochures, basically it'll have um, a map for each county, and I'll tell you which ones are recreation, which ones are conservation, and appropriate access points, maybe what kind of facilities they have, things like that. So that's a very valuable resource at all of our local boat ramps. Um, in addition to that, I have our contact information up here. You're always welcome to shoot our office a call or email and kind of ask us about specific islands or specific questions you might have. Um, and we have a website, too, that's www.spoilonproject.org, where we have maps of the different spoil islands, list of events that we're going to be having going on, and just basic information about what you should know when you're going out to visit the islands. And then if you have a smartphone, if you're a little more tech savvy, uh, we have a, a Google map. If you just uh, search for Spoil Island Project on, on Google Maps on a smartphone, you can, you can find kind of a custom map that shows you the different designations of the islands and also which ones have some recreation structures. So that's really handy for on the water. And we also have a Facebook page. Recently, we started a, a citizen support organization called Friends of the Spool Islands. Basically, it's a nonprofit group whose sole purpose is going to be protecting and enhancing these um, Spool Islands get out there to raise more awareness to the public about the value of the resource. So I highly encourage you to check them out on Facebook uh, and see what they're all about. They're a new and up-and-coming uh, nonprofit, and we hope they're going to really be, be a really big boon to our uh, Aquatic Preserve Office as they move forward. So just more frequently asked questions about visiting the Splons. get a lot of questions about you know what kind of the rules are, and it's, it's not like it's posted out there explicitly. But basically, you know, common sense, the recreation islands or education islands for camping, we ask people to stay off of our conservation islands because it's such valuable habitat. Um, the campsites are available on a first come, first serve basis. There's no fees or reservations for camping out there. Um, since there's, we are a small staff, we rely on a lot of our volunteers and spoil island adopters for any type of cleanups. We ask you to you know, pack out any trash and waste that you pack in, um, and obviously refrain from cutting any shoreline vegetation. Uh, the islands are all um, not natural. They're not part of the natural hydrology of the Indian River Lagoon. And they are all eroding in one way, shape, or form. So any damage to that shoreline vegetation is going to, in turn, cause some additional erosion on the islands, which we want to try to prevent. So I, I hammer it home a lot. I don't mean to uh, be a dead horse, but we are a, a small office, and we are very reliant on the community and our agency partners to accomplish a lot of our goals. Basically, we have a working group called the Splalm Project, um, which is just kind of a collaboration of different organizations, academic institutions like Harbor Branch, um, volunteers and different community groups to accomplish any of the projects that we seek to enact. So just a quick kind of logo stream of the different uh, groups that we work with. It's, it's a lot of different working people that we, we bring together to accomplish our goals. So we, we will set these people to work a lot of times during the fall months. Typically the second Saturday of the month we'll take volunteers out and we'll just accomplish goals for specific islands as we see fit. 
Um, we'll have some long work days. We'll go out and do kind of the basics, removing exotics from the islands, planting native plants to increase biodiversity or create nice shade for camping. Um, we work with a lot of Boy Scouts and uh, other nonprofit groups to install, install picnic tables and fire rings. Um, and we also have the adoption program, which is now kind of part of the, the Friends of the Spool Islands, where uh, different groups can adopt the Spool Island and kind of take it under their wing and, and take care of it for, for us and help us kind of spread some of that, that work around. And like I mentioned before, we have our Friends group, which is up and coming as well, to, to help promote that type of enhancement and, and protection. So I mentioned we do a lot of exotic removal. I don't know if you guys are familiar with some of the invasive species that we have here in Florida. One of the big ones plant-wise is Brazilian pepper. You probably guess where that comes from. It's um, a, a very big invasive. There's a, the Florida Invasive Pest Council that uh, categorizes different exotic plant species, and they've listed it as a category one exotic, which you don't have to know exactly what that means, but just know that it's really bad. Um, it's infested a lot of the state. It, it uh, basically is an opportunistic plant that crowds out other native plant species, reduces the biodiversity of the area, doesn't provide that same habitat for, for uh, our local wildlife as, as some of our native plants would have. Basically, it becomes what's called a monoculture, which is just in an area 100% Brazilian pepper. And that just, like I said, reduces the biodiversity of the whole area. It, it really thrives in disturbed areas. And that's essentially what the Spool Islands are, was just instantly created disturbed areas. So Brazilian pepper colonize it pretty readily. It's also in the same family as poison ivy. So some people will have an allergic reaction to it, which definitely isn't good. And we discourage people from burning it on the Spool Islands for that reason. Because if you're allergic to it and you inhale that smoke, it's not going to be a good time for you if you have an allergy to it. Um, the other one we have is Australian pine. These names are super simple for guessing where they came from. Um, it's not a true pine. It's actually um, in an entirely different family, and its needles aren't true needles like a pine tree that we do have in this area. Um, it was brought over here in the 1800s as a windbreak. Uh, farmers really liked it because it grew really tall, really fast, and they could use it to kind of divvy up their, their farmland as well. Um, the problem with that is it doesn't do very well in high winds. So when you get a Florida hurricane that comes through, it doesn't fare very well. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, another problem with both Brazilian pepper and Australian pine is they're both salt tolerant plant species. So if you guys are familiar with our native plants, uh, the mangroves, we have three species of mangroves here, and they occupy the niche of growing along shorelines in brackish water. And they're very good, our mangrove species, at preventing erosion, stabilizing shorelines, and providing habitat for our local wildlife. Brazilian pepper on Australian pine can grow within that same niche, but do not provide the same habitat value. Uh, like I said, they, they are really prone to falling over, washing out, you lose the shoreline, and they're not providing the, the, the refuge for, for fish and invertebrates like you get with our native plant species. Another big thing about Australian pine is during its, uh, when it drops its needles, it produces a chemical from its dropped needles and from its roots that prevents and inhibits other plants from growing in that area. So it kind of in a multi-phase way prevents new plants from growing in that area and inhibits the biodiversity. Um, like I said, a big problem with Australian pine is it's not adapted to the high winds that we have in this area. This picture is an Australian pine that used to be standing upright. And we have my assistant here who's in the middle kind of demonstrating the scale of it. Um, basically, what happens in Florida is Australian pine roots don't grow down. They don't have like a deep tap root. They just grow to the sides. So they don't have anything really strong to anchor them in. So when it gets really windy, they're prone to just blow right over. So you can picture this root. This root mass you know, was about 90 degrees forward, and the tree has fallen back kind of away from the stage. Um, so where, where this root mass is. Now, that used to be land up until the storm came through. The root mass blows over, and then the whole shoreline washes out because of the disturbance of the soils. So that's, that's one of the big problems for our spool islands, as well as our local shorelines on the mainland or on the barrier island. It's when these uh, plants colonize the area, and then they do blow over, you're going to have some significant erosion wherever those, those tend to fall. So I mentioned um, I had that map before of spool on BC 47. This is an island up in Brevard County that we've done a lot of work on. We've uh, partnered with uh, Florida Institute of Technology to do a lot of different enhancement work and research projects on the island. So I was going to give you just kind of a flavor of, of what some of our volunteer-based projects look like. So this is a, a aerial, a historic aerial of Swell on BC 47 from 1994. You can kind of see the general shape of it um, and just show you the morphology of how it's changed over time. Kind of keep an eye on the northern shoreline. Uh, something that happens here in Florida, especially in the Indian River Lagoon region, um, you know, we get northerly winds in the wintertime. They're typically very strong. And that's where we have our greatest erosion, um, is during those strong northerly winds in the winter. The Indian River Lagoon also has a seasonal tide, as well as the kind of the day-to-day -day tides. So the, the wintertime, you know, October, September, October, November, is the highest water levels we have in the Indian River Lagoon year-round. So if you couple the northerly winds of kind of wintertime with really high water, that's a recipe for erosion that we see a lot on our spool islands. So this was 1994. 
2004. This is pre the 2004 hurricanes. And then if you look at that northern scarp, it's kind of got a chunk taken out of it. That's after the 2004 and 2006 hurricanes. And then 2009, a couple stormless years, it's, it's balanced out a little better. Um, so this is kind of an overview of this flow with a lot of the restoration work that we've done on it. All the different red blobs are areas that we've gone in and removed different exotics from the island. And all the different dots are different native plants that we've put out as part of kind of an experiment to see what types of plants would thrive on a school island. So down on the ground picture of what it would look like, basically this area here that's open now was 100% Brazilian pepper monoculture. You can see we've only cut it back to about here. So this is, this is still Brazilian pepper and some Australian pines that are existing there. But we've cleared out this area, kind of liberated the Brazilian pepper and created a recreation area for people to come and, and utilize. We also worked with a bunch of Boy Scouts and Florida Institute of Technology to install picnic tables and fire rings and some educational signage to kind of increase the recreational value of the island. In addition to that, uh, pretty much any time we're out on the water, we're always doing cleanups for a number of reasons, just uh, for safety issues, removing derelict fishing gear, or anything that can prove uh, danger to, to people or the environment. So uh, ghost crab traps are really a big issue. Um, we, we participate in a yearly ghost trap crap removal. that happens um, actually every other year in July or August. And we remove monofilament and um, cast nets, things that would be entanglement to, uh, threats to wildlife. So like I said, I had that picture. We, we planted a bunch of native species on the island and kind of used it as a test plot to see what would thrive. Um, this, the small islands aren't a natural system, as I've already said. But they kind of mimic what we see on the Barrier Island and on the mainland, close to that kind of coastal strand and what is called maritime hammock plant species or plant communities. And so we basically just picked plants from those plant communities that exist naturally, planted them on the lawn, and, and went to see what would work. And we had some really great results for it. We also worked with uh, Florida Institute of Technology to do a bunch of educational sign for the, signage for the island. I had the picture of the kiosk being installed, and these are just some of the signs that they put up. It was a, a great product, and it helped to educate local visitors and just make them aware that these islands are being managed and, and kind of how to treat them with respect. So this was the, the one side of the kiosk that just has a map of the area, kind of you are here, the designations, and, and why, why the islands are designated that way. And then uh, a more specific uh, sign, specifically for BC 47, that explained some of the history of the island, uh, how it's been utilized for recreation, and the different restoration projects that we've conducted there. So I showed you the, the kind of time series that's elapsed, and that northern, that northern uh, shoreline that eroded out as a scarp. And this is uh, kind of a, a case study that we did to see if we could, with some pretty simple and effective means, um, stabilize shoreline to prevent that erosion from happening. So this is kind of a lessons learned example. It unfortunately didn't work out. And you're going to see in the pictures how it didn't work out. But it was something that we used uh, with community involvement to implement. And it was a good experiment to see how we can maybe prevent some erosion from happening on those school islands. So we had that scarp. Basically, with just volunteers and shovels, we smoothed it out to about a 45 degree angle. And we got this coconut fiber matting. It's called core matting. It's spelled C-O-I-R. And basically, it's made from uh, recycled coconut fiber husks. And it's used as an erosion control blanket in a lot of areas. So basically, we just spread that coconut fiber husk down over the, the scarp as a way to, to stabilize that shoreline. And then with, with volunteers from FIT, we went out and we replanted that, um, that, that scarp with a bunch of dune stabilizing plants, things that you're going to see along the barrier island that grow along the dunes there to help stabilize and prevent erosion and kind of accrete some soil in that area. So this is it about two weeks after planting. Uh, you can see you know, they're, they're all like one uh, single plugs that we put in of a couple different species. Um, and they're you know, very new at this point. After a couple uh, weeks of rain, we planted it in the summer to kind of capitalize on those rains that were happening. And then in September, we started getting a little bit of an erosional scarp as we had those uh, winter winds out of the north and the high water levels come in. And then unfortunately, we had what they were calling the no-name hurricane um, in October of 2011. And that did a real number on our scarp, unfortunately. But like I said, it was a learning experience. That's, that's what I call whenever something doesn't go very well. It was a learning experience um, to kind of see how we can better do this in the future. Uh, basically, we, we tried to roll with the, prunt, the punch. We planted some different species that were a little more um, appropriate for the intertidal area. And we just monitor it. We've been monitoring it for the past four years now. Um, and, and what we kind of found, uh, slowly but surely, is the plants that survived along the top of the scarp basically dropped seed and recruited along the bottom. So it definitely didn't pan out the way we hoped it would, but we are getting some shoreline stabilizing characteristics of that shoreline just kind of inadvertently from, from the, uh, the, the native plants that we planted there. So we're continuing to monitor it this day and kind of see if there's other types of methods 
that we can utilize to, to make these projects a little more successful in the future. So, uh, and that's just a, a black mangrove propagule that we saw um, coming up from the one of our erosion control nets. And that's kind of one of the end goals of any of these shoreline stabilization projects is we want to have it succeed to a fully vegetated mangrove shoreline because that's where you're going to get the most uh, shoreline stabilization. So that's an example of a, a volunteer-based kind of bottoms-up um, shoreline stabilization or spoil enhancement project. I'm going to talk about one that's more top-down, a, a big dollar project that we did on a different spoil island. It's spoil on SL3, so it's the third island in St. Lucie County. And it's actually just down the Harbor Branch Channel. You can see it if if you're looking down the channel from the water there. So it looks a little different than it does in this picture right here. But basically the problem with, uh, with spoil on SL3 was that uh, I had a lot of mosquitoes. There's an interior wetland on the island that um, bred so many mosquitoes that nobody wanted to use it for recreation anymore. Uh, and because people weren't use, utilizing it, the Brazilian pepper kind of grew in, crowded out all the campsites, and it didn't have much value to the public anymore. So St. Lucie County Mosquito Control and a number of other organizations pitched in money to do an entire uh, exotic removal and enhancement of the island to mitigate the uh, mosquito problem and, and make it more valuable for, for recreation as well. And then we maintain it through our spoil island, spoil island working group partners. So this is the island before restoration, and this is what the island looked like immediately after restoration. And you can see, obviously, the island's been removed of all its exotic plant species. Only the native plant species survived. So that's kind of a good uh, indicator for any spoil island in the Indian River Lagoon what percentage of the plants on the island are native versus exotic, and it's very close to 100% uh, most of the time, with you know percent of some mangrove fringe and maybe some cabbage palms and some other native species. Um, so this is a um, aerial of the shortly after the um, the enhancement was done. You can see we had trails cut through. Um, it's hard to see, but all these little green dots are about one gallon plants that we put on the island, and all these little white um, trails that are going around are PVC. They had to water the plants for about three to four months after they were planted to make sure they got established in and ensure the success of the site. And like I said, there was an interior wetland on the island that was breeding the mosquitoes. This is, is, this is that interior wetland. It was dominated by mangrove species, so they let all that stay. And basically what they did was they dug a trench that allowed that, uh, that wetland to flush to the Indian River Lagoon and have some fish come in there and predate on the, the mosquito larvae and just kind of prevent uh, be from becoming such a big mosquito breeding ground in the future. So. Just a couple of shots. This is what the, this, the site looked like pretty much immediately after enhancement. We had a number of campsites that were, were opened up and, and uh, cabbage palms around them to provide some shade. And here's a down on the ground picture of kind of what, how the profile changed. You can see the mangrove fringe remains and some cabbage palms, but all the big Australian pine and a lot of the Brazilian pepper are gone. If anybody's interested in plants, like I said, we had a, a lot of native plants that we put on the island. This was another great uh, example site to see how different native plants would thrive in uh, you know, essentially a, a clear-cut area that doesn't fit into kind of the natural regime of uh, the hydrology of the area. So you know, basically the types of plants you'll see in this area, green buttonwoods, cabbage palms, things like that. I have a number of different plants that we put on there if anybody's interested. Strangler figs were another big one uh, for, for shade producing for, for recreational value. And it was interesting to see not only how the plants that we added survived, but how native plants that we didn't add kind of came in and recruited. We did a lot of follow-up work to make sure none of the exotic plants kind of reestablished, but obviously we facilitated any native plants that recruited in to allow them to flourish in the area too. So that was one of the most rewarding things is seeing a lot of these native plant species recruit on their own, either by um, water dispersal or by birds. And we did have a lot of non-native recruits that we uh, controlled for aggressively. Madagascar periwinkle, which a lot of people will grow in flower pots, but it spreads very, very um, voraciously uh, out in the open. Crowsfoot grass, balsam apple, just different types of invasive uh, plants that we had to deal with. And then with the help of the community, after we did the, the big contractor work, we, we went out with local school, school groups and we planted some of the more sensitive areas that the contractors couldn't really get to with their heavy equipment. So those were, those were shoreline plantings that we did. So I have a couple time series to just show you how those sites looked like the day of planting versus a little while afterwards. So this was 2011, the day of the planting. Um, all these are, are plugs of shoreline grasses that we added here. You can't see a lot of them, but there are little little single plugs of, of grasses that we planted in the area. And then about a year later, how, how that site's changed. And the big value of this is this is going to prevent the island from eroding because all these plants are going to serve to, to anchor in that sediment and stop it from washing out. Um, in addition to the, the shoreline plantings that we did, we wanted to see how the, um, the contractor placed plants did. So we set up photo stations around the island 
basically once every couple months for up until present day, actually. We go to these different photo stations, which are marked by these red dots, and we just take 360 degree photographs and then compare them year after year and see how the island has changed. So I have a couple uh, photo series here to just kind of show you how things were. So this is a down on the ground kind of shot of some green buttonwoods that we planted pretty much the, the day of planting. This is the interior wetland here that was the native vegetation. And this is on day one, October 2010. So a, year, a little over a year later, March 2011, you can see they've come in as well as some of our other native plants. Um, only a couple months later, after the rainy season, when we have a lot of our growth occur, uh, even more vegetation. July 2012, even more. It's, they're you know, 8 to 10 feet tall now. And then August 2013, um, 10, 15 feet tall. And they've, they're reestablishing kind of the profile of the island in that upland vegetation. I have one that's a little more recent than this, but it's, it's essentially just plants right in your face at the photo station. So I didn't include that one. But it is kind of cool to see basically they've, they've colonized the entire area. One more site on the island. This is more of an upland area that was a trail. And then some kind of uh, landscaping grasses of Spartina bakeri, which is another native species. And then in 2012, you can see how, how all that's come in. So uh, that's it for you know, kind of the spawn enhancement project. But I did have uh, another one of our, well, I guess, a personal pet project of mine that I've been working on um, and relates to the spawns is diamondback terrapins. So that's a, a local species of the Indian River Lagoon that not a lot of people are aware exists. So actually, just curious, raise a hands. Has anybody heard of a diamondback terrapin before? Couple, wow, I'm very impressed. That's, that's the most hands I think I've ever had uh, actually be familiar with them. Um, but basically, the diamondback terrapin is a brackish water uh, turtle species that lives its entire life within an estuary. So it's very unique. We have a number of different subspecies that live throughout North America. And within the Indian River Lagoon region, we have essentially one of our own distinct subspecies. So quick breakdown here. Like I said, there's seven subspecies total. Five of them are, are found in Florida, and three of them are endemic to Florida, which means the entire species or the entire subspecies lives its life within the state of Florida. And one of them, which is called um, the subspecies is Tequesta, called the Florida East Coast Diamondback Terrapin, lives almost entirely within the Indian River Lagoon. So it's, it's essentially our Indian River Lagoon uh, brackish water turtle species. And they feed on a variety of invertebrates and fish in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, they're really good at grazing on periwinkles and other small snails. And they kind of keep those, those populations in check to uh, prevent them from overgrazing on other vegetation. So that's kind of how they fit into the niche of our, our local environment. Um, they, they hibernate in colder months. Um, it's, it's actually not quite understood if they hibernate a lot in, in our area. In the, the Florida Keys, that subspecies doesn't really hibernate. The ones to the north of us do hibernate. And um, the Indian River Lagoon species, since we kind of straddle that temperate and tropical zone, um, it's kind of unknown whether they, they hibernate. Maybe they do sometimes in colder months and, and don't in others. But um, they will come out of the lagoon to, to nest during the, the spring and summertime. So around the same time that sea turtles are coming out of the ocean to nest on ocean front beaches, we have diamondback terrapins coming out of the Indian River Lagoon to nest on our lagoon front beaches. And so that's one of the, actually the big issues that's um, affecting them now is, is loss of habitat and loss of nesting areas. So quick map breakdown of the different subspecies. And you can see our Tequesta subspecies occurs from Volusia down to about Miami-Dade County, almost exclusively within the Indian River Lagoon. And then we have a couple other subspecies that go up the east coast of, of uh, then North America and then into the Gulf. So, like I said, the terpenes have a lot of different threats that are plaguing them. The biggest and, and baddest kind of is habitat loss. Um, they, they need nesting grounds. They need sandy beach areas along the Indian River Lagoon in which they can come out of the water to nest. And we have a lot of what's called hard stabilization in this area now, basically bulkheads or seawalls, vertical cliffs, essentially, that the terpenes now can't access their, their historic nesting areas. Um, the, the second big one is nest predation. Although diamondback terpenes haven't really done great with the introduction of, of humans to our area, one animal that has done really well is raccoons. And so raccoons love eating sea turtle eggs, and they love eating the diamondback terrapin eggs. And so they, they predate a lot on uh, any diamondback terrapin nest that get uh, found. And I think it's, it's estimated about 98% of all diamondback terrapin eggs do not make it to the hatching stage. stage. So either predated on or just they don't um, emerge for one reason or another. So their, their most vulnerable life cycle is right in, the, right in their nesting stage. It's not a big of an issue in our area, but it does happen in other areas, uh, crab trap mortality. Diamondback terrapins are opportunistic feeders, and so they, they have no problem feeding on, say, the bait in a crab trap. And so they'll, they'll kind of work their way into the trap uh, to get at the bait that's stored in there. And then if the, the trap isn't removed in a certain amount of time, they're, they're very prone to drown. So it's not as big of an issue in our area, probably because there's not a lot of populations of diamondback terrapins left. 
but in areas like the Northeast, it is a very big issue for them. And they actually require in certain states that you put what's called a bycatch reduction device on your, uh, your crab traps to prevent terrapins from getting in there. Historic overharvesting is another really big issue for diamondback terrapins. Back in the 1920s, they were considered a food source and a delicacy. Um, if you ever heard of turtle soup, terrapins typically are the turtle in turtle soup. Um, it fell out of favor actually during prohibition, interestingly enough. Um, Diamondback terrapin, one of the key ingredients in diamond or terrapin soup or turtle soup was sherry. And once prohibition happened, you couldn't add sherry to your turtle soup anymore. And apparently, sherry was one of the critical components of turtle soup. And so it really fell out of favor and, and didn't become as popular as it used to be. In our area, one of the biggest issues is actually lack of knowledge. There's not a lot of research into our local diamondback terrapin population, so we don't have a good idea of how well they're doing uh, anymore. In other states, there's a lot more research into their population tr uh, trends, and so there's actually protection status that's, that's been afforded to these uh, species. In Florida, actually, they're an unregulated species. I'm almost um, give pause to tell you this, but if you have a commercial or a recreational fishing license, you're allowed to take two diamondback terrapins a day to, to eat or kind of do what, what you'd like with them, since there's no research into um, how that species might be threatened. There's no protection status that's afforded to them. So. Like I said, I, I covered a lot of this. We have our eastern uh, Florida diamondback terrapin. We have a couple populations that we do know about, um, and we're doing our best to protect those and manage them uh, as appropriate with, for, through our aquatic preserve program and with a lot of our local partners. Um, the big ones are actually up in Brevard County, uh, the Banana River area, if you're familiar. There's an area just west of Cocoa Beach called the Thousand Islands, and that's a lot of semi-natural islands that exist that serve as nesting habitat for these terrapins, so that's where we have a good population. Um, around Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge, we have some, some populations as well because there's a lot of natural habitat there. And we have some scant reports actually of diamondback terrapin sightings around uh, some of the impoundments in St. Lucie County. So that's one of the areas we're really looking to break into and do a bit more research on is what kind of populations do we have in this area? Are there no populations there or do we just not, have we just not found them yet? So we're trying to accomplish this through an, a number of different ways. Uh, kind of the, the main theme I've always got across is we're very reliant on the community to help us out. And the Diamondback Terrapin Project is no exception. So one of the, the, the most lucrative ways that we've been able to, to map these Diamondback Terrapin populations is through citizen sightings. Um, this picture on the right here is a um, kind of a, a GIS file of all the different places we've had citizens report in Diamondback Terrapin sightings. We've, we partner with the Brevard Zoo, and they have um, an email address. It's terrapin at brevardzoo.org, where people can send in, hey, I saw a terrapin here. And with smartphones these days, you can get pictures, you can get latitude, longitude coordinates, and we're able to pretty accurately map where these terrapins are found. Um, and most of the times, the sightings are going to be during nesting, um, during the nesting season, because that's when people are most likely to come across them, when these terrapins are leaving, the female terrapins are leaving the water in order to lay their nests. Um, our office, in partnership with the Brevard Zoo and our other organizations, are also doing a number of different uh, methods to try to get a better idea of the species. We're doing some trappings in areas, so we can do marker capture studies. Basically, we set out traps. Uh, non-lethal traps to capture terrapins, and we'll do what's called scoot notching, where we'll, we'll file a, um, a little notch in the a side of their shell. And basically, you can do it in a numbered way and, and get an idea of, um, or you can accurately tell which terrapin that is if you capture uh, again. And so basically, if you do this enough times, and you can see how many times you're recapturing the same, same terrapins, how many times you're catching different terrapins, and get an idea of what the overall population density of the terrapins in that region is if you do it enough times. Um, and the main goal of this area is to try to find a better ways to manage the species. And we know that habitat um, is one of their limiting factors, so how can we identify and protect those nesting areas is, is a really big thing. And another part of that is we're trying to educate local landowners as well. In a lot of these areas, uh, particularly the Cocoa Beach Thousand Islands, backyard nesting is actually one of the main places where we have our terrapins being seen. Um, they're essentially leaving uh, the lagoon through people's kayak launches or boat ramps and coming up and laying their nests in people's flower gardens in their backyards. And as we started reaching out to these people, you know, they didn't at first know what they were, um, just knew that a tar uh, some weird turtle would come out of the water, dig up their flower garden, and then go back. And they didn't know what that meant exactly. So we've been able to work with a lot of these local, hand owner local landowners, make them aware of kind of what's happening, and, how and kind of teach them the best ways to manage the terrapins that are nesting in their own backyards. So the citizen reporting email address has been, like I said, by far the most lucrative way. So I just have a couple quick collages of over the past two years of the terrapins that we've seen. Um, it's been very, very beneficial, thankfully, like with the advent of smartphones and everybody has a digital camera now, we're able to confirm that these are diamondback terrapins and not some sort of freshwater control species. So we've gotten a ton of, ton of pictures and people have really gotten on board with, with um, participating in this program. 
And like I said, we're, we do a, a pretty big carpet bombing campaign during the, um, the nesting season to really make people aware where we advertise during um, the nesting season in local newspapers, uh, newsletters, anywhere we can kind of get the word out on social media, make people aware that these terrapins are going to be kind of in your backyard in the near future and encourage people to report sightings. So, they are an amazing species. I, I, I'm very into them. I'm from New Jersey, as, as Dennis mentioned, and there's a lot of uh, diamondback terrapin, terrapin conservation that happens there. And so that's kind of where my passion formed. Um, and so I, I've been very happy to be able to bring that down here as well. So. With that, I can throw it out to any questions about the, the Spoon Project or, or our Turpin work or anything other questions you have about the Aquatic Preserve Program.